uh, at the uh, Mendota Par 3, where I'm the uh, pro. Uh, and uh, I uh, generally enjoy uh, playing uh, with him uh, because I usually come out okay. So uh, he has many sports interests, uh, hockey being one of them. He's, he's written other uh, books. Native of the Iron Range from, from Buell, uh, wound up down here. He's worked for the railroad system. He's now retired. And it's been uh, a great uh, relationship uh, with my knowing him all these years. So, George, take it away. Thank you, uh, I am getting on in years, so if you don't mind, I will sit down in the, ta in the taller chair. Yeah, uh, Roger mentioned I'm from the range. And I don't think there's anybody else here that can say that. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing about the range is, I left when I was 18 years old. That was a long time ago. But I was born in Virginia, Minnesota on the range. So I'll always be a ranger. Somebody that, say, moved to uh, the range in 1944 and had a child with them who wasn't born on the range, not a ranger. Once you're born there, you're always a ranger, but you've got to be born there. This is the book that Roger was talking about. came out last year. And um, unfortunately, I don't have any copies left to sell. It's available on uh, Amazon. You can get it in two days, Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. And uh, the book, it isn't the title I picked. The original mock-up showed the title I picked, which was called Falling Stars, which mainly referred, of course, to the North Stars, although it did include a chapter on the lawn. Um The next thing you know, the book comes out, and it's called to my surprise, a history of professional hockey in Minnesota. Well, that would take a much, much bigger book. But for some reason, History Press thought that this was the title, so I went with it. And uh, it's 120 pages long. Um, there are a couple of things that aren't in the book that I wanted to put in the book that I written about, but had to been cut from the book. And I think they're significant enough that I can at least make it a presentation here. The two things have to do with violence. And uh, if, if I'd subtitled the book with my title, A Falling, St Falling Stars, the subtitle would have been A History of Violence. And um, that way, that, that's sort of an homage to uh, David Cronenberg. Now, you Canadians know who David Cronenberg is. And that was uh, his movie, A History of Violence. Uh, Cronenberg with the exploding heads and um, Siamese twins and all his, all his strange movies. But... Um, but the fact is, is that the history of the North Stars is stained with violence. Nothing could be more violent than death on the ice. And that is what happened in the inaugural year of the Minnesota North Stars. And that was included in the book. It had to have been included in the book because it was so significant. In January of that year, Bill Masterton died from injuries suffered during a game with the St. Louis Blues at the Metropolitan Sports Center in Bloomington, Minnesota. The best guess today is that Ma Masterton suffered a traumatic head injury compounded by one or more previous concussions. Masterton's tragic death in some ways was a prelude to what was to come for the North Stars and national media, media attention regarding violence on ice. 
it's kind of curious that the two instances that I'm talking about occurred with the North Stars and the Boston Bruins. Let's look at the first one. Although they lived in different times, Charles Dickens and Margaret Mitchell could have combined to write the story of Henry Boucher. Great expectations gone with the wind. <laughs> On January 4th, 1975, North Star Boucher, who was the hero of the 1969 Minnesota State High School Hockey Tournament. He uh, played for War Road. They did not win. They lost in the finals. He was injured, but he was the most memorable thing about the 69 state tournament. And he is from War Road. He's still with us. And uh, that makes him one of us, is a thing that Minnesotans do. Once uh, somebody has mentioned an actor or somebody, who just happened to be born in Minnesota. He's one of us. But he had his NHL career effectively ended at the age of 24 when his right eye met the stick of Bruin Dave Forbes. Earlier, on August 27, 1974, General Manager Jack Gordon traded one-time Calder Trophy winner Danny Grant to the Detroit Red Wings for Boucher. Gordon told Boucher's attorney, Brian Smith, that he, Gordon, planned to build the North Stars around Boucher. In his autobiography, Boucher admits to having mixed feelings about the trade, acknowledging that the North Stars weren't a good team, but they had some pretty good guys. The team for which the 23-year-old Boucher was to have been the centerpiece was floundering with only 11 wins against 21 losses and five ties. They would go on that night to lose to the Bruins eight to nothing. The game was played on the same Met center ice where Masterton was fatally injured eight years earlier. Accounts of the Boucher incident vary, but this much is known. Boucher and Forbes were both in the penalty box for roughing. Both players were observed yelling at each other. When the penalties expired, Forbes and Boucher crossed paths. Without saying a word, Boucher struck Bush, I mean Forbes struck Boucher in the eye with the butt end of his hockey stick. Boucher had blood spurting from his eye while he felt the ice, whereupon Forbes jumped on his back and began pummeling him. Referee Ron Wicks ejected Forbes from the game. Sir Boucher, he was taken to Met Methodist Hospital. hospital where the next day his eye was swollen shut. Forbes telephoned Boucher in the hospital and apologized. Amazingly, after all of this, Boucher returned to the ice that season and finished with 15 goals and 14 assists. Boucher played on, despite what was diagnosed as a closed brain injury, as well as damage to the muscles surrounding his right eye. He played on despite double vision, depth perception problems, and limited peripheral vision. Now, had this incident with Forbes occurred today, there's no sane team doctor in the country that would allow him anywhere near the ice. It's similar to Kirby Puckett having his career ended. But this was 1975, and players were told to suck it up and get back out there. 
Boucher was later told by a Mayo Clinic physician that there are six muscles that control looking up and down or, and then working in, contra in concert with the other eye. Three of Boucher's six right eye muscles were damaged beyond repair. While well, Boucher sucked it up and resumed his hockey career, after all, it was the only way, only means he had of earning a living. Others were not content to let the Forbes incident slip by. As for Clarence Campbell, the NHL commissioner, he leveled a $200 fine and a 10-game suspension without pay on Forbes. That was not good enough for an ambitious Hennepin County attorney named Gary Flackney. Flackney reasoned that a prominent Minnesota native and Native American to boot had been mugged in front of 15,000 potential witnesses. Gary Flackney filed aggravated assault charges against Forbes. Never before in sports history had an in-game incident resulted in criminal charges. The NHL Board of Governors were stunned and feared the worst for their league. The ripple effect could be devastating should precedent be set as a result of the uh, a potential Hennepin County victory in court. Among other things, the end result could have been a ban on fighting in hockey. But as it turns out, the NHL didn't have to worry. The trial was over in 10 days. It ended when the jury foreman told the judge that the jury was hopelessly deadlocked. After all, it only takes one to hang a jersey. I mean, to hang a jury. Jersey, too. <laughs> and uh, that one person, uh, or he or she, could have been a fan of uh, old-time hockey. Anyway, the uh, jury was hopelessly deadlocked. But having gained, succeeded in gaining himself national publicity, Flackney decided that that was sufficient uh, and declined to retry Forbes. There was, however, further legal action. Boucher was convinced by his attorney, Brian Smith, to retain the Detroit legal firm of Dykema, Goodnow, Spencer, and Trigg. Sounds like somebody falling downstairs to file a lawsuit in Wayne County, Michigan against Forbes and the National Hockey League. The crafty Smith stood to gain 25% of any settlement proceeds. proceeds. Attorney Smith had earlier arranged for Boucher to sign a four-year contract to play hockey for the Minnesota Fighting Saints of the World Hockey Association. As it turned out, that was equivalent of getting 100% ownership of a tapioca mine. <laughs> in the WHA, the one-eyed Boucher somehow scored 15 goals and had 20 assists in 36 games before the Fighting Saints evaporated into the pages of hockey history. Of course, his four-year contract was worthless after that. In the meantime, the legal process droned on and on. After five years, it was over. Boucher and his lawyers settled the case out of court. Here's what he said in his book. I had enough of lawyers, enough of their greed and thoughtlessness of the individual client. I told them to settle, Boucher said. And then he, he's quoted, after working on the final settlement costs, we settled other debts and the lawyers got their share of the money. I took a little cash up front and chose to take the rest over a 30-year period. As for Dave Forbes, he played for the Bruins until 1977, when he was claimed by Washington in the waiver draft. His career with the Caps ended early in 1978. 
He finished the season with Cincinnati of the WHA. Following season saw him toiling with the Binghamton Dusters of the AHL. After that, nothing. Forbes was 29 when he hung up his skates for the last time. Well, let's move on now to February 26, 1981. The North Stars are at the Boston Garden where they've never won. And the night ends with that streak intact. The final score was Boston 5, Minnesota 1. Another Boston massacre. It's not the final score that's important. It's what happened during the game that's significant. The North Stars coach at the time was Bloody Glenn Sonmore, who in the previous decade coached the Goon Gang, otherwise known as the Birmingham Bulls, of the World Hockey Association. Prior to that, Sonmore was the man who put fighting in the Minnesota Saints. To Glenn, there was never a problem that couldn't be solved. With, couldn't be resolved without fistic, with, with fisticuffs. Glenn reasoned that the only way to keep a losing streak is to beat the other, to, your opponent to a pulp. Today we hear a lot about targeting in professional football. For some, more targeting allegedly meant assigning each of your guys a rival player to maul. Well, the game started, the opening puck was dropped. Seven seconds later, the North Star's six-foot-four-inch winger, Bobby Smith, was throwing punch, punches at a startled five-foot-eight-inch Steve Casper. Referee Dave Newell responded by handing both Smith and Casper with major penalties. A mixture of chippiness followed, including Steve Payne getting into it with Keith Crowder and landing three solid blows. Unfortunately, one of the blows found the chest of linesman Kevin Collins. Next, Jack Carlson got into it with Terry O'Reilly, followed by Tom Youngins versus Mike Middlebury and Craig Hartsburg versus Mike Gillis. If that wasn't enough, then all hell broke loose. Last year, Tom Youngins told Hockey News that part of the pregame meal involved Sonmore matching teammates with opposing Bruin players. Another account has General Manager Lou Nanny drawing diagrams on a backboard, blackboard, in effect choreographing the mayhem that was to come. Nanny on October 15th of this, this year told me none of this was true. What we do know is that with the clock at 8 minutes and 58 seconds, Ray Bork was called for a high stick penalty on Al McAdam, who took offense and retaliated with his fists. Brad McKinnon of the Bruins challenged Greg Smith and got the worst of the encounter. As he was being escorted to the penalty box, he got into it with Gordy Roberts, which prompted Crowder to attack Greg Smith. Both benches emptied. Payne had been hit with two 10-minute game misconduct penalties and was sitting in the locker room. He was subsequently joined by Hartsburg. The pair was listening to the game on the radio. When the benches emptied, both Payne and, Hare and Hartsburg left the locker room and in the hallway encountered Crowder and Bruin backup goalie Marco Baron. More fisticuffs ensure, uh, in, ensued, and soon the hallway was filled with players from both sides. Bruin officials, policemen, security guards, and a luckless photographer was caught in the, in the middle. This is all in the concourse. Crowder and Payne got into it and both slipped and fell on the tile. Cops managed to separate Crowder and Barron from Payne and Hartsburg, but could not stop McCrimmon, who was rapidly approaching. Out of the corner of his eye, linesman Gord Brosaker saw McCrimmon coming and pushed the two North Stars 
into the referee's dressing room and locked the door behind them. It, the whole thing was a scene straight out of uh, Vince McMahon and the WWF, or worse, the movie Slapshot. Boston coach Jerry Cheevers was not idle during the high, uh, hallway scrum. Cheevers attempted to spoil Gordy Roberts' face. And this disturbed Sonmore, who entered the fray but was tripped by a Bruins fan who somehow appeared in the concourse. Sonmore went down screaming with a threat on his lips. He wanted Cheever's head inside of a basket. First period lasted 90 minutes, featured 67 penalties, and saw the Bruins take a 2 to nothing lead. This would be all that Boston would need for the win. 67 penalties is a record that stands today and is not likely to be broken. It's like Joe DiMaggio's 56 game hitting streak. All in all, there are 84 penalties called, including 16 majors and 13 game misconducts. For Minnesota, the uh, game misconducts went to Hartsburg, Payne, McAdam, Roberts, Carlson, Greg Smith, and Young Hands. For the Bruins, the game misconduct penalties went to McCrimmon, Crowder, O'Reilly, Middlebury, and McNabb. Does anyone have any questions? I'm not a big fan of Goonery, and I'm not asking this as a means of uh, trying to excuse an art star from that. A uh, little context could be good in that, as I recall, this was. I mean, what was the buildup? Why did they do this? And as I recall, it was just that the, the North Coast had been, Pinelink had been abused by the Bruins in recent games and came out wanted to take a stand. What, what, what was it in the past that led up to this? Well, there, there was uh, the, the, the fact that the Stars were given the reputation of being, for lack of a better word, pansies and that they had a bunch of players that would not retaliate if provoked on the ice. And uh, this wasn't the way that Glenn Sonmore coached, and he wanted to get some life into the North Stars, as it were. And uh, this is what happened. Any other questions? I, I remember talking with Ben Sonmore, and uh, at some point later on, he was unhappy because the penalty record for that game was surpassed by somebody else. Am I remembering that wrong? Or was it that uh, game no, game? That's, this is this is all time record. Maybe, maybe in a different league, maybe in a uh, WHA, but no. I seem to recall that Jim Dory was involved in that other game. Hmm. According to the hockey no, news. I, yeah. I'm not saying it's true. Yeah. I, I just. Uh, Sort of According to the hockey news, this is the all-time record. No. Okay, thank you. Jim Dory would have been four really? yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think Jim Dory still holds the record for most penalties in one game. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, please, Jim Dory. Yeah. Oh, first game. <laughs> <laughs> Very first game of the league. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> was there any long-term uh, change in the style of the, to the sort of play? Did, did it spur the guys on, or was it a one-time event? Yeah, well, that's the question. That's the res end result, I suppose, was that the Bruins met the North Stars in the playoffs that year, and the North Stars swept them in three games and the feeling was is that and I don't buy into it myself is that they were inspired this 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 brawl this violence created within their minds the fact that maybe they could actually beat the Bruins but this nebulous I'm not buying it any other questions what was the league's reaction? Were there rule changes following that? Nope. 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 Uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the wire service report that I read focused more on the, uh, the game action rather than the penalties. 
it was like the fourth paragraph before they mentioned, oh yes, there, there were quite a few penalties in the game. Apparently routine at the time, but uh, did not attract that much attention uh, on the wire service. The Minneapolis paper, though, the uh, Minneapolis Tribune did have a lengthy account of the, uh, of the, of the brawl. Which Carlson was this? Jack. Yeah. The one who wasn't in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> who missed out on that fun. Right. Hmm. Going back to Forbes, and I remember, I'm from here, and also later Cicerelli and stuff like that, and just all the sports. They, they don't want any outside prosecution coming and they want to say we can handle it ourselves, whether they can or can't. So I'm all for, if it's something of that nature, there being prosecution involved. The problem is with sports, you got the Toronto where the prosecutors felt that they had to get involved with violence and hockey, coincidentally enough, because it was the uh, broad street bullies that were uh, applying the violence, so they proceeded to charge uh, a Watson and Bridgman of the Philadelphia Flyers uh, with the assault on uh, Toronto Maple Leaf. And then there was another episode sometime after that where another individual got charged and uh, a Toronto defense lawyer was asked, well, uh, what can be done to stop all this uh, assault charging? He says, well, get the prosecutors to charge a Toronto Maple Leaf with something. Mm -hmm. And then the prosecutors will have to go away because of the public outrage. And that's exactly what happened. What was the result of, uh, of the, the uh, trial? Or was, it, was there a trial? Yeah, there was a conviction, I think a guilty plea, and a few fines, and that was the extent of it. But uh, with respect to Forbes and Bushy, uh, I read uh, one account in which uh, Forbes was explaining uh, how he um, stuck uh, Bushy uh, in the eye with a stick. And apparently what he was intending to do was to, if I can just sort of demonstrate. <laughs> 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 Imagine I have a stick in my right hand. Where are the Yes. And uh, so I'm advancing on Henry Boshi. And apparently the blade is way the heck up there. The butt end is down here. I'm making to take a punch at Henry Boshi. And I'm attending, because I'm trying to do two things at once, to drop the stick and to then take the punch. And apparently the two of them don't happen. And the punch comes along. And it's the, the butt end that uh, manages to connect with uh, Henry's eye. That's according to Dave Forbes explaining his his actions uh, in his court case. All right. Well, thank you very much, George. All right. We'll take a.